Hello class. Uh, we're on the banks of the Muskegon River in the city of Nuego, Michigan. Uh, that is a cold body of water today. It's 29 degrees here around us and uh, we're going to study the book of Amos, the Lord willing. Another paragraph in chapter number seven. Let me tell you a little something about the river. It has intrigued me for several years. We've been preaching in this area for, for some time. It is, uh, it is, as a river, one of the slowest flowing rivers uh, that you'll find anywhere. Average about two miles an hour, uh, I have read. It is uh, 216 miles long, lower peninsula of Michigan. Uh, and uh, uh, this river, its deepest part is from here all the way over to where it essentially enters into Lake Michigan. Uh, they stock it with salmon, can you believe that, and other species of fish. Uh, you say, preacher, seems like you like to have class about rivers. Everywhere you see God dwelling in the Bible, listen to me, there flows a river. In the Garden of Eden, where God would go and walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve, there was a river. In New Jerusalem, there at the throne of God, there will flow a river. In the millennium, according to Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, there will flow an amazing river. And, uh, and in so many ways, and, and uh, Paul, by the Philippian church, started essentially the first person, and it was saved down by a riverside. I, I just enjoy class sometimes by a river. Uh, preacher, what's our text? Amos 7, verses 7 through 9. Uh, can you read this? Can you see it? I'm going to hold it up uh, in a way that I trust you'll be able to read it. Here's the text. Thus he showed me. God is uh, showing Amos something again. This is the third such vision. Behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. Uh, Preacher Bagwell, what is a plumb line? It is a usually a lead ball, something heavy on the end, and then a rope that extends from that lead piece up to the hands of a contractor, a builder, or an engineer, and you use it to measure and see if a wall is straight, to see if any building is straight, if it is square, if it is built uh, firmly and, and, and with precision. And uh, God's got a, you can see it, God's got a plumb line in his hand. I don't know if I've positioned myself so you can see it. And the Lord said unto me, God is speaking to Amos. Notice he calls him by name. What seest thou? What do you see, Amos? What seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I'm going to see if they're straight or if they're crooked. I will not again pass by them anymore. I will not, oh my goodness, think of the tragedy of what God just said. I'm going to measure my people. I'm going to put the standard of my righteousness. Are they straight? Are they approved in the eyes of God? And they are not. They have sinned egregiously. And God says, I know the results. They're crooked. They're wicked, they're ungodly, and I will no more, I will no more pass their way. Listen to that. 
Let me get you to see it again. I will not again pass by them anymore. That is the final word. That's the ultimatum. Verse 9. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. God says, I'm going to destroy my people. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. If that is not a message of judgment, I have never heard one in all my days, years of reading the Bible. Let's talk about this passage of Scripture. Begins, then he showed me. This is God showing to Amos another vision. That word showed, we've had it two times previously in the last two classes, the last two visions, ra'ah. But it is in the hiphil stem, H-I-P-H-I-L. Preacher Bagel, what in the world does that mean? God has caused Amos to see. It is the causative stem. God has caused Amos to see this vision. God's plan, what God's going to do. And behold, I've read you the text now. And behold, that's that little interjection, hini. H-I-N-N-E-H. Uh, it is a statement of surprise. Uh, either God is aghast at what he's about to do, or Amos is absolutely amazed at what God's about to do. And behold, I believe it's Amos here. And behold, the Lord stood upon a wall. Here's God as a carpenter. Here's God as the creator of the nation of Israel. And the Lord... And the Lord stood upon a wall. That word for Lord is Adonai. Adonai. Could pronounce it, depends on how it's written, Adonai. And, and what does it mean? He's the boss. He's the owner. He's the one in ultimate control. Oh my. And the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. A wall to see if it's straight. A wall to be sure it's not leaning. Right. And by the way, uh, at God's buildings, you can be sure of this. New Jerusalem is in plumb. It's right. It's straight. Uh, our lives, if I may uh, speak metaphorically, uh, our lives, because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus positionally in God's eyes, we're straight. We're righteous. But God's measuring Israel. He's got a plumb line in His hand. I hope you're seeing. I am in my mind's eye. I'm seeing God standing there with that plumb line in his hand. A lead ball at the bottom of it. Let's see. Let's see if these people are straight. Are they obeying me? Are they being, are they being uh, subservient to my word? And we all know, having studied these Amos lessons, Israel is not. She's rebellious. She's stubborn, gone against the will and the way of God. Verse number eight. And the Lord said unto me, and the Lord said unto me, hear, hear the word for Lord. And if you'll notice it in your Bibles, look class, all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D, Lord. That's the name Jehovah. Jehovah. Now, here's something I want you to notice. In these two verses with which we have begun, God is Adonai and God is Jehovah. I, I want you to hear Brother Bagwell, and I'd sort of like to get an amen. We serve one God. He has several names, many, many titles and roles, but we serve one God. We are not polytheistic in our doctrine. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. Uh, we, uh, and, and though God is triune in His manifestation, uh, triune in His personage, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. And here our text proves it. He's boss, Adonai, owner, husband, 
absolute ruler, and he's also Yahweh, Jehovah, the God who is always present, uh, the God who wants to enter into relationship with mankind. And the Lord said unto me, said, it is a, Amar, A-M-A-R is the verb, and it's an imperfect verb. Uh, that means God talks and talks some more and talks some more. Let me tell you what we have going on here. We have a conversation between the Lord God Almighty and Amos in this vision. Can I tell you, there's some of these Old Testament men of God that live so close to the Lord, so so much in harmony with the Lord that it could literally be said of them, they walked with God. I'm going to improvise a verb. And they talked with God. Enoch. Didn't I read in my Bible? Yes, I did. Enoch walked with God. And one day in that long walk, God took him. God carried him to heaven. Enoch walked with God. We are told that Noah walked with God. Oh, that, uh, that and then Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Mm. The Lord said, Amos, all I'm trying to say, Amos is walking with God. The Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? What do you behold in this vision? And Amos reports, uh, Lord, I see a plumb line. I see a plumb line. That is one of the most discussed words in the book of Amos. This plumb line uh, paragraph is probably one of the better known sections of Amos, even for those who have not studied the book uh, in any, uh, any detail. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the plumb line, the word that is used there for a plumb line, a-N-A-K, Anak, A-N-A-K. But it is only used in the whole Bible in this paragraph. Listen to me. It comes up four times, four times in these three verses, and that's it. Never anywhere else in my... That means God is teaching a special lesson, a unique lesson, a singular lesson, a, a lesson like which there is none other in all the Bible. God wants us to live straight. He wants us to live right. He wants us to live spirit-filled lives, and He has the right to show up and test us and examine us and measure us any time He pleases. After all, He is the Lord. Amos said, Lord, God and Amos talking back and forth. And I see a plumb line, a plumb line. And then said the Lord, and then said the Lord. And we're back to Adonai now. Adonai now, a a owner, boss, controller, even husband, a, a, a time or two. Uh, 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 and thus saith the Lord, behold, that is the second interjection in this text. Wow. Amazing. Can't hardly believe it. It's shocking. Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. That little verb set, it is spelled S-U-M. I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. And all it means, I will put, I will place, I will appoint a plumb line. Does anybody believe the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good? Oh yes, preacher, we believe that. God says, I've got my eye on Israel. I, I, I've set my plumb line. You know what the plumb line of God is? Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. His entire word, the Bible, is God's plumb line. I'm not supposed to take the Bible and conform it to my desires. No, no, no. I am to conform my life and my pattern after the Word of God. The Word of God is to rule supremely. God said, I'm going to set my plumb line in the midst. The word there for midst is Q-E-R-E-B. It means right in the middle. Probably, probably right in the middle of Samaria, their capital city. 
And if not that, right in the middle of Bethel, their, uh, their place of worship, God said, I'm going to set my, in the midst of my people Israel. Notice what he called them, my people Israel. And the word there for people, let me spell it. It's A-M, A-M. Well, Brother Bagel, I, I don't know what that, it, 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 this is the word for people. It's not the word for Gentiles. It is the word for my kinsmen, my loved ones, almost my family. It's got a familial, uh, 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 my people Israel, the apple of his eye, his chosen people, people that he loves dearly, uh, uh, people from, uh, uh, he formed them because he called Abraham out of the Gentile land of Ur of the Chaldee. There's a tone of endearment and love and a broken heart of God. I'm going to have to set a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. Ever heard this expression? Question asked, question answered. God put the plumb line there. Question asked, are they straight? Are they righteous? Are they living for me? Question answered. God already knows they're not doing so. Amos has preached against sin after sin after sin and caused Israel, uh, called Israel to repentance and they would not, they would not obey Almighty God. They're rebellious to the core. And God comes to a conclusion. God makes a decision. It's one of the saddest passages in the book of Amos. Anywhere in the Bible, really, chapter Number seven, verse eight at the end. Let me reread to you that last line. I will not again pass by them anymore. I will not again pass by them anymore. Oh, what a strong grammatical construction this sentence actually is. I will not that adverb, that negative, uh, uh, not, is spelled L-O, low. It is the strongest negative, single word negative in the Hebrew language. No exception. This is the absolute negative. God said, I will not again. Even, even the qualifier, the modifier again is a verb. It doesn't look like a verb, but in Hebrew it's a verb. And it is the verb that gives us the noun Joseph. Uh, it is spelled Yosef. Yosef. And preacher, what does Yosef mean? Adding and adding and adding. For the last two visions, God's going to judge with locust. The second one was most of it, more severe. God's going to judge with great fire. And Amos said, oh God, could I intercede? Could I plead? Oh God, please, please, would you forgive them? Vision one. Oh God, please, would you cease? Would you just say, God, don't do this judgment so quick? Vision two. In this vision, God does not give Amos a chance to intercede. God does not allow his precious prophet to, to say, Oh God, no. Oh God, don't do that. Oh God, I, I plead for that. I will not again. Adding and adding and adding. I'm done. Not going to add any more repentance. Not going to add any more patience. Not going to add any more tolerance. I am, I am again. I will not again pass by them. I will not again... I'm not going to them in love. I'm not going to them in grace. I'm not going to go to them in forgiveness. I'm not going to go to them in loving and providing for them and nourish them. I shall not pass by them anymore. And the word for pass by, that verb, A-B-A-R, a bar. Preacher, we don't know what that means. That is the Passover verb. God said, if you'll put blood Israel, young Israel, precious nation to him, obedient Israel at this point, if you'll, put, if you'll shed the blood of that lamb, put that blood on the doorpost, on the lintel, and uh, I, I will pass over you. I, I'm passing over in judgment, but if I see the blood, no judgment will come. That is a Passover of grace if you've got the blood. That is a, and if there's no blood, the death of the firstborn in every house in Egypt occurred. Oh, the sadness. I will pass over you. In grace. Here, here, I'm going to pass over them. I've got I to gotta make that negative. I will not. 
hey, I'll never fly over them again in grace. I'll never, I'll never fly uh, because of their sin. God's patience has a point of exhaustion. God's patience can come to the place that it is absolutely exalted. He said back in the book of Genesis, my spirit will not always strive with man. My spirit will not always strive with man. And God means, I'm telling you, God means exactly what He says. There goes a boat up the river. My, my. Been fishing in this cold weather, I presume. I want to say something to America. God's been good to us. God's been kind to us. God's been gracious to us. But if we don't repent, and I got a feeling if we don't repent soon, God's going to say, I will not again pass by them anymore. The anymore, those two words anymore, it means over and over. It has the idea of perpetuity again and again and again. I will not again pass by them. I will not again hear their prayers. I will not again hear their plea. This happened to Judah uh, quite some years later. Uh, they had sinned and they had sinned and God finally made up his mind. He was going to destroy them. I was going to send them into captivity for 70 years. He's going to let the Babylonian army, wicked Nebuchadnezzar, come in and punish his people, carry them away captive for seven decades. And God said, Jeremiah, you've been praying for them. Don't pray anymore. Don't you call on my name for them again. I am through. I'm going to judge. The day may come if our precious nation does not repent that we're going to face the wrath of God that He'll no longer pass by us in the spirit of revival. He'll no longer pass by us in a, in a spirit of forgiveness and, and patience and love. I'll not pass by them anymore. Isn't that a terribly heart-wrenching, sad verse of Scripture. God says, I'm done. I'm through. And God is going to use the Assyrian army to tear Israel to shreds. We have one more verse that we must discuss. Of course, that's verse number nine. Uh, some of the commentaries that I uh, consulted uh, say verse 9 should not go with verses 7 and 8, but honestly, class, I've studied it and I've prayed about it and I believe it does belong here. Let me, let me reread it to you. Let's talk about verse 9. God says, this is God's decision. This is something God's going to do and He's going to do it uh, without any reservation. For the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. Let's talk about that word, high places. If you are uh, wanting to learn Hebrew, the word is spelled B-A-M-A-H, Bama, and it means heights. It can mean waves when that boat went by. The wake produced waves down here uh, under my feet. It can mean waves or it can mean ridges, like yonder's a ridge on the other side of, of the bank of this river, the high places. Preacher, I don't understand that. Uh, God's going to make the high places of Isaac. Isaac is another name for Israel. Isaac is another name for the ten tribes. Isaac is another name for these Jews who, whose capital city is Samaria and, and uh, uh, the high places. What does that mean? I can tell you exactly. They worshipped their idols. They worshipped their idols in what the Bible calls high places. High places. They tended to do their filthy, ungodly, lewd, sensual idol worship up in a grove of trees, up in a high place. Someone says, why did they worship? All the way through the prophets, God condemns their high places. God rebukes them for, for worshiping in their high places. 29 degrees and I'm sweating. I'm getting excited talking about a, a God who's holy and a God who keeps His Word and means His Word even if judgment is involved. Oh, the glory of God. That's what we must maintain. The righteousness of God. We must preach it and preach it. I'll destroy those high places. High places for this. Number one, they believed they were getting their gods closer to heaven. 
hear me, they believed they were getting their gods closer to heaven, high places. <laughs> Excuse me for gloating. I have a God that lives in heaven. I have a God that created heaven. I have a God that's going to take me to heaven someday. They're trying to get their God in high places. Second reason, those high places had trees. Explain this to me. Now, and, and, and it might take some pondering. Why is it they always wanted to worship their gods and goddesses? Filthy, sexual, lewd acts being performed. Uh, I, I, indescribed. I could not talk about them. I uh, wouldn't do it in a, in, in, a, in a Christian class setting. Why? They wanted a tree in the midst. They had to have a tree. Now, some say they may have carved that tree and used it as part of their idol worship. Uh, they wanted a tree. Here's what I think. In God's Garden of Eden, in God's location of innocence, I mean, when God created this earth, put Adam and Eve in that place, there was a tree. There was a tree of life. Of course, there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a tree in the garden, a tree. In, and by the way, in New Jerusalem, there's going to be a tree of life, a tree of life. I think the devil, who's just a copycat, he's just a mimic in his high places where his gods, where his demons are worshipped. I think he wants a tree like God had in him up in the groves, up in the tree. God said, I am going to make desolate. I'm going to make desolate those high places. The verb there to make desolate, S-H-A-M-E-N. This is what it means, wasted. God says, I'm going to waste their high places five times. It's used that way. Destroyed. God said, I'm going to destroy their idol worship centers. Used that way three times. Astonished. 21 times. Astonished. God said, when I get through with your idol worship places, when I get through with Bethel, when I get through with Dan, two Jewish cities, they had turned into idolatrous havens. God said, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be astonished. You're going to be, uh, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. Then, and the sanctuaries of Israel, the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. By sanctuaries, the holy places. That's definitely down at Bethel. They're supposed to be worshiping Jehovah. If you ask them, are you worshiping God? They'd say, yeah, we're worshiping Jehovah. But they've got this golden calf. And they're worshiping the golden calf and calling it Jehovah, that won't work. God's not, God will not share His glory with another. Thou shalt not make unto me a graven image. You'll worship me and you'll worship me alone. He has said again and again, they got their sanctuaries. They got their sanctuary. Listen to this word. Mick, M-I-Q, Mikdash. That's sanctuaries. But listen to this one time. And it's in Amos. We'll have it. If not, next lesson, the one after that. Uh, it is translated to chapel. It is translated to chapel. Uh, it's from Kodesh. It means holy place. They've taken, they've taken places God would love to be holy and they've turned, it into, they've turned it into debauchery and filth and ungodliness and sin. And, and, and God says it will be laid waste. It will be laid waste. And the verb there for laid waste, seven times dried up. One time decayed. God said, I'll rot it to the core. Two times it is translated slain. I will kill all those uh, false priests who have practiced idolatry there. And this is not God describing the Assyrians now. This is God saying, I'm going to do it. I put the plumb line on them. They're still crooked and wicked and ungodly. I'm going to send my judgment upon my people Israel. I'm going to lay them waste. I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God said, I will rise against. That's Q-U-M again. I will rise again. I will be established. I'm going to attack. I will rise again against the house of Jeroboam against the house of Jeroboam. And the house of Jeroboam, that could include all the way from Jeroboam 1 to the king now where Amos is preaching, Jeroboam 2. It is wickedness. It is filth. 
It is apostasy. It is idol worship. And God said, I'm coming with my sword and I'm going to attack that house, that wicked house of Jeroboam. Class, this is the strongest statement God has made yet about what he's going to do to his rebellious people. America, America, take note. 